Simplicity and ease is what you get when you host your podcast with Audio Boom. You can post up to five episodes per month, you get unlimited storage, and 500 minutes of recording time for each episode. Plus, advanced analytics, embeddable players, distribution of your podcast via Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Sovin, Spotify, and Stitcher. Pending approval by each platform. Right now, you can sign up for Audioboom's $9.99 monthly subscription plan and get your first month free by using promo code BOOM. That's B-O-O-M for one month free of hosting and distribution. Sign up for our $9.99 monthly subscription plan today. Welcome to the fifth episode of True Gambling Stories. I'm the writer and host, Sean Chapin, and I want to give a big thank you to all our listeners out there who've supported us and continue to download. Please tell your friends and thanks for all your help. If you've missed any episodes, please go back and give them a listen. And as always, any five-star reviews, any nice comments, anything like that sure does help us out. At True Gambling Stories, we take a look each month at a unique tale of gambling or poker lore. They usually involve some dice, cards, casinos, plenty of wagering and an occasional gunfight. Summertime brings about a special event for gamblers, the World Series of Poker. In honor of that, this month's episode features one of the world's best known poker tales. It's the story of how one of the most famous American lawmen of the Old West met his ultimate demise at the card table. Dead Man's Hand, the shot in the back that killed Wild Bill Hickok. Wild Bill. It's a name synonymous with the Old West. And if you know anything about poker history, that name really means something. The story stretches the expanse of American folklore in the poker world. Born in Illinois in 1837, Wild Bill's real name was James Butler Hickok. He was raised on a farm and his parents instilled discipline in their son from an early age, as well as their abolitionist views. The Hickok home was a stop on the Underground Railroad before the outbreak of the Civil War. Growing up hunting on the farm, Bill was a natural shot with a pistol. His skills improved in his teens to a dead-eye accuracy. That marksmanship would certainly serve him well later in life. In those days, young men grew up quickly. Hickok's father died when he was just 15. In 1855, Hickok got in a fight in which he and his opponent both fell in a canal. Both young men thought they had killed the other. With a thirst for adventure, he soon headed west. He stopped for a couple years in Kansas, serving some time in General Jim Lane's Free State Army. The Army was in fact a vigilante group, also known as the Jayhawkers, who fought against slavery. When the Civil War broke out, Hickok served in the Union Army as a marksman and a spy. Wild Bill was always doing something most men only dreamed of. Even early in life, Wild Bill was a hunter, a trapper, a spy, a soldier, a scout, and a sharpshooter with a gun. He was a man's man and a hell of a shot. In fact, George Custer himself once said, quote, Whether on foot or on horseback, he was one of the most perfect types of physical manhood I ever saw. His skill in the use of a rifle and pistol was unerring. As if he didn't have enough going for him, Hickok was also a handsome guy, with piercing eyes, a strong jawline, and long, flowing red hair. The ladies certainly noticed. (laughs) Custer's wife, Libby, was one of those ladies who noticed. She once said, He was a delight to look upon, tall, lithe, and free in every motion. He rode and walked as if every muscle was perfection. Wild Bill was that guy in high school who seemed to just have everything going for him. And he was still just a great guy. He was a real-life Old West James Bond, only a better shot. The name Wild Bill was given to him for his many exploits in his life of adventure. Standing six foot one inch tall, Hickok must have been an imposing figure with his two Navy Colt pistols holstered at his side. By 1858, he had embarked on his career as a lawman in the Old West. He first was named a constable in Johnson County, Kansas. He later served as a federal marshal in Kansas and then as a sheriff of Hayes, Kansas in 1869. By 1871, he was marshal of Abilene, Kansas and would spend most of his life in law enforcement. Law enforcement in those days meant something completely different than it does today. 
Much of the country was indeed the Wild West, and dealing with ruffians and outlaws was a regular part of life. There were no Miranda rights to give out. Either you straightened up, or you faced the barrel of a gun. Author and historian Aaron Woodard has spent years researching the Old West. His new book, The Revenger, The Life and Times of Wild Bill Hickok, will be released in late June. He believes that Wild Bill's life as a lawman is what makes him so memorable and endearing to many Americans. I think the thing that made him unique was that his most of his gunfights were done not as an aggressor or somebody out just to kind of go on a killing spree, but they were done in his capacity as a law officer. And his his job, you know, was to defend people and uphold the law, and almost every one of his gunfights had some component of that, where a lot of people who were gunfighters, you know, they were involved in all kinds of things over women or drink or whatever, and Hickok, you know, really wasn't like that. He had a vicious reputation, but um, Buffalo Bill Cody was a good friend of his, and he said, I think I'm quoting this directly, he said, Wild Bill wasn't a bad man, but he was a bad man to tack- tackle. What were some of these outlaws like? Many were what you might imagine from cowboy movies. It really was the Wild West. Most of the people that he was involved with were just kind of run-of-the-mill troublemakers. There was there was one man in Hayes City, Kansas, who was just kind of a bully, just kind of a public nuisance. His name was Strahoon. And in this, that particular gunfight, that was 1869, they were in a saloon there, and this man was but several of his friends were just kind of creating a public ruckus. He was actually stealing glasses out of the saloon and putting them in a vacant lot nearby. And the old owner of the saloon was just, you know, kind of at his wits end to know what to do. He called Hickok, and Hickok came and tried to talk this guy out of doing that. And the guy says, anybody that tries to stop my son is going to, you know, is going to be shot. And he said, if you try that, I'll, I'll carry you out of here. And apparently this straw hoon broke a beer bottle and was going to try to attack well Bill with it. And Hickok shot and killed him. His days of disturbing the peace were over. The American West was a wild scene during the mid to late 1800s. Men headed west seeking their fortune, many with gold in their eyes and a six-shooter by their side. Laws were often flouted by rowdies looking for a good time and easy yet illegal financial scores. Poker is a game of risk, bluffs, and competition. The game began to capture many Americans' free time and seemed to fit with the country's expansionist spirit and economic growth. The game began to flourish in saloons and back rooms and along the banks of the Mississippi River. It even captured the interests of famous American author Mark Twain. The game was in an evolutionary stage during the 19th century. Poker, which had begun in the early 1800s in saloons and Mississippi River steamers, was becoming a game of skill. In its infancy, the game was played with only a 20-card deck, ace, king, queen, jack, ten, dealt evenly among four players. In the 1840s and 50s, the game was innovated, bringing about the more modern games we know today. The 52-card deck was introduced and draw poker was created, allowing more players in on the action and skill to become a key factor in success. Jim McManus is the author of Cowboys Fool, the definitive book on poker history. Uh, Well, poker was developed in the south and and the rivers along the Mississippi and the steamboats above New Orleans. And it was a more popular game before the Civil War in the south. And after the, after the war ended, since the South had lost, naturally more of its young men seeking jobs had to migrate west. They just, the, the North, having won, most of the, the Northerners stayed home. So that the Western migration uh, after the Civil War was mostly uh, Southern men moving west, due west to Las Vegas, to what was it called Las Vegas then it was called uh, Washoe and then also into the uh, gold fields up in California and in the, the in the Dakotas so the, <clears throat> the the game that developed in the western states was was mostly southern in flavor and they had uh, the, the the, the, the two most popular games were five card draw and stud, and most of the stud played in the um, out west was five card stud. 
In subsequent years, as the game became a regular part of life for Civil War soldiers, stud poker and other seven-card games were added as well. But this was not like playing at your buddy's house or a brightly lit, secure casino. Poker in the 1800s was often associated with cheating, and for good reason. It was rampant among early players on the Mississippi and then among dark, smoky saloons in the Old West. Jim McManus details a bit about this cheating environment. One of the things that we should remember is that while we play in very professionally lit card rooms with a fresh deck coming into the game every 25 or 30 minutes, in the in the in a Western saloon, especially at night, the lighting was minimal. The decks had been used over and over and over again, so that the cards had naturally developed little marks. Sometimes there were cheaters in the game, and they would mark the cards specifically, uh, you know, to be able to identify the aces and kings more quickly. But even when there was no cheating, the decks were. Um, bent and scratched up, plus the lighting was um, terrible, so that people with very, very sharp eyes who could who could see the marks on cards and remember what they were had big advantages over players who had, whose vision was less acute. Beyond marks or crease cards, cheaters were common in the game, and those guns at the tables were occasionally put into use over a dispute. Were there, there were devices that moved up and down inside one's sleeve to, to, to be able to move an ace or another key card in, in, into to uh, introduce it into your hand in the middle of a after a big pot had developed uh, there were pe- people used mirrors as they were de- mirror grains as they were dealing to see to be able to see what the um, what cards were in their opponent's hands for much of the um, 18th century poker was known accurately as the cheaters game. So today, when we can, we consider the art of poker the way, for example, the Germans, the young Germans play. They have the art of poker is that they are very, very aggressive, and they they have algorithms in their heads that um, are very effective in winning high, super high roller poker tournaments. The art of poker in the um, 18th century often consist. I'm sorry, in, in the 19th century, often consisted of people's cheating skills. It wasn't until uh, much further on into the 20th century that uh, po- square poker became, uh, play- and playing square poker well became the uh, a more important skill. Wild Bill once claimed that his pistols had killed hundreds of men. His skills with a gun were unmatched. Fitting with his interest in betting, he claimed that as a young man he won quite a bit of money shooting at dimes for a half dollar a shot. But was he really a great shot? Or like so much about Bill, was this reputation with a pistol more myth than reality? Historian Aaron Woodard says his keen marksmanship was indeed a reality and that Hickok was forced to kill many an outlaw during his time. He was well known for his accuracy, and he, he preferred an 1851 Colt Navy pistol. That was what he was known for using. But then in all of his gunfights, he was never wounded, and in almost every instance, he, the other person died. So he must have been a, just a deadly shot. He always knew where to, where to aim. And the other thing about it, too, he was somebody who was cool under fire. And I've never been shot at, you know, and I know some veterans who have, but it must be a pretty terrifying experience. And whenever he was in a situation like that, he always was able to maintain his cool. And in most cases, he was able to eliminate the other guy. So that's a unique characteristic to be able to be like that in a gunfight. Watch any Western, and what's that big climactic scene? The two gunfighters face each other down in the middle of town in a classic duel. Both men draw their pistols, hoping to be the fastest and the best shot to survive another day. Woodard says these types of battles are mostly myth and didn't really take place, except for one Hickok gunfight that remains a major part of Western lore. It also shows the importance of poker in Wild Bill's life. So this happened July 21st, 
Live in Springfield, Missouri. And this was a gunfight between a man named Dave Tut and Wild Bill Hickok. And it had to do with a gambling debt that Hickok apparently owed to Tut. They had been friends, I guess, for some time. And they played poker pretty frequently. On this particular day, Hickok had lost quite a lot of money to Tut. And Tut claimed that Hickok owed him $45. And Hickok said, no, it was $25. And they had a big dispute about that. In any case, Tut wouldn't play anymore unless Wild Bill put up some collateral. So he put up his watch as collateral. And he warned Tut, don't be caught in public wearing that watch. And Tut apparently took that as a challenge. And he did wear it in public. And they met each other in the public square there of Springfield. And the square is about 80 yards by 80 yards, so it's a pretty big area. And Tut was down by the courthouse, and Hickok was across the square. And they both fired simultaneously. And it's about 75-yard distance between the two of them. And Tut missed Hickok, and Hickok hit Tut. And Tut staggered back to the courthouse and grabbed one of the arches of the courthouse, and then he fell down and died. And the coroner who examined them after the gunfight noticed that the bullet had entered Tut's right side between two of his ribs and kind of that led to the deduction that Hickok had shot him sideways from 75 yards away with a black powder pistol which is a remarkable shot yeah this was the only time we know of really in history where this that actually happened where the two gunfighters were kind of out you know out in the, out, out in the daylight facing off each other and shooting each other so this was kind of this is what all those movies are based on Throughout his life as a lawman, Poger always interested Wild Bill. It was a game that occupied much of his time. In fact, many observed that his law enforcement duties were only a brief interruption to his usual duties as a poker player. And while he loved the game, he wasn't necessarily a 19th century Doyle Brunson, as Aaron Woodard notes. You can kind of trace the history of his life, all different periods of his life he was involved. He really liked to play poker. And a number, of the, a number of the situations he was involved in revolved around that. There were complaints when he was in Hayes City as a lawman there that he had spent too much time doing that. He actually hired some deputies who kind of did some of the routine patrol work and things. And they'd call him if there was a real serious disturbance. But he played cards off and on all of his life. And apparently he was not very good at it because he seemed like he was often in debt or having to borrow money from somebody or... Something like that. So I guess he just really enjoyed it, but wasn't very good at it. By age 34, Wild Bill had developed vision problems, possibly glaucoma. He began to look more and more to poker as his main source of income. After being let go from his marshal position in Abilene, while vision is certainly important for modern poker players, it was even more so in the late 1800s. With decks of cards not easy to come by, creases and bends in a card were normal. Good players could discern these cards and use them to their advantage. Bill may have had trouble with this because of his vision problems, which was exacerbated by the poor lighting in saloons of the Old West. And like what many modern players go through occasionally, he soon found himself broke after extensive time at the table in Kansas City. Losing all his money was apparently an event he went through several times in life. His love of poker was well known, as Jim McManus explains. The most famous of these uh, cowboy poker players was Wild Bill Hickok and there was a, a extensive uh, coverage of his life in a uh, in a, Harp, a series of Harper's Magazine articles in which his his um, effectiveness as a sharpshooter got less as he, as he got older and his vision wasn't quite as sharp as it had been earlier so eventually um, as as people like as Hickok um, needed to, to supplement his income as a sheriff, few and fewer towns were um, interested in hiring him to be a lawman. He made he, he made more of his living as a poker player. After marrying Agnes Lake in 1876, the couple headed to Deadwood. The town was flush with newfound riches after the discovery of gold in the Black Hills in 1874. 
Hickok was looking to settle down with his bride and separate plenty of gambling miners from their newfound cash. While Bill Hickok was a lawman, gambler, gunslinger, folk hero, and even an actor briefly in Buffalo Bill Cody's traveling show. But it was poker that occupied most of his time and would be what many would remember him for. On August 2, 1876, Hickok was playing five card stud at Nuttall and Mann Saloon in Deadwood. One can imagine this Old West scene, a dimly lit saloon with prospectors and cowboys drinking whiskey. A couple men puff on cigars as smoke drifts through the air. A worn poker table sits in the corner with a few grizzled veterans like Wild Bill and a couple of young bucks who headed west, hoping to strike it rich. Hickok was known for his storytelling and may have been spinning a tale about one of his adventures, maybe a gunfight, or like many poker players today, telling about a bad beat that led to a hefty loss. The saloon's owner, Carl Mann, was one of those at the table. As a man who had jailed or shot many outlaws, Hickok usually liked to sit with his back to the wall. On this day, however, his usual seat was occupied. His seat that day gave him a view of the front door, but a side door was out of view. As cards were dealt and chips tossed, a cowboy named Jack McCall slipped into the saloon through the front door. McCall made his way past the poker table and moved to the end of the bar behind Bill where he couldn't be seen. As players checked their cards and tossed their money into the pot, McCall raised his pistol. He steadied his aim just out of sight of the game. The longtime outlaw pulled the trigger. A shot exploded into the back of Wild Bill's head. Cards and gold coins flew as Bill's body jerked forward. The other players sat in stunned silence. Bits of bone and brain covered the table. As Bill bled out, McCall made a dash for the rear door firing two more shots in the general direction of the poker table. He jumped on a horse to attempt an escape, but the saddle cinch was loose and McCall fell off. He then hit in a nearby butcher shot, but was quickly discovered and forced out at gunpoint. A coroner noted that the bullet traveled through the base of Bill's brain and exited through his right cheek between the upper and lower jaw bones. The coroner said death must have been instantaneous. Even in death, those in attendance said Wild Bill still clutched his cards. Two black aces and two black eights. Two pair. A stellar hand. Even 142 years after his death, aces and eights has become synonymous with Wild Bill's death. Dead man's hand is the most notorious hand in poker. Wild Bill as a character, whether real or fictional, is nothing new. Through much of the late 19th century and early 20th century, pulp novels and magazines told the stories of real-life Western heroes. The lives of lawmen, cowboys, and outlaws like Wild Bill, Billy the Kid, Wyatt Earp, and Jesse James were detailed in print, from gunfights to stagecoach robberies to duels in the streets. Wild Bill Hickok comic books were published throughout the 1950s, featuring his adventures throughout the West. As an example, issue number 10 featured the lawman battling Sam Bass, a real-life 19th century train robber. On the cover, the comic trumpets the battle between the two. America's greatest gunfighter, Wild Bill Hickok, in a fight to the finish with Sam Bass, the deadliest killer in the West. Separating fact from fiction about Wild Bill has become difficult. Numerous other media treatments followed his death in 1876, including radio, television, and film. Guy Masterson played Bill in the TV series The Adventures of Wild Bill Hickok for seven years in the 1950s. He also played the lawman hero in a radio series from 1951 to 1954. More recently, Josh Brolin played the hero in the television series The Young Riders from 1989 to 1992. HBO even featured Wild Bill in the popular series Deadwood in 2004. On the silver screen, Hickok has been played by numerous actors including Gary Cooper, Roy Rogers, Robert Culp, Charles Bronson, Jeff Bridges, and Sam Elliott. 
Fans of the Three Stooges may also remember that Mo Howard even played a version of the hero in a 1937 episode. Mo's character was named Wild Bill Hiccup. Entitled Goofs and Saddles, longtime Stooge Larry Fine played a character who was not quite so wild. His role? Just plain Bill. For real, and it was pretty funny. After the murder, Bill was buried in a new black suit and white linen shirt. A marksman to the end, his rifle was laid at his side in this coffin. As from a call, a jury was impaneled and he was charged with murder. This was no ordinary trial, however. Deadwood was located in Indian lands and South Dakota was not yet even a state. A trial would be held in a local theater. Jurors were chosen from a list of 33 men from three mining camps in the area. The trial began and McCall even spoke in his own defense. He told jurors, quote, Wild Bill killed my brother and I killed him. Wild Bill threatened to kill me if I ever crossed his path. I am not sorry for what I'd done. If I had to do it over, I would do the same thing again. Ultimately, the jury found McCall innocent and released him. A sad image of the value of human life in the Wild West. This would not be the end of the matter, however. After the career criminal McCall committed some thefts and robberies, he bragged to a newspaper reporter in Laramie, Wyoming, about killing Hickok. A deputy U.S. marshal arrested him on August 29, 1876, and judges ruled that the miner's jury in Deadwood was illegal. McCall was put back on trial in Yankton, South Dakota on December 4th. Wild Bill's brother Lorenzo was in attendance. A jury found McCall guilty and he was sentenced to the gallows. He was hung on March 1st, 1877, after all his appeals were denied. He was buried with the noose still around his neck. The famous murder is a big part of Deadwood's history even today. The site of his burial in Mount Moriah Cemetery now features a bronze bust of his likeness. It's the most popular site on the property. The reasoning behind the murder has been debated for decades. From a perceived personal slight toward McCall, to the allegation Hickok had shot and killed his brother, to a gambling disagreement. Many disputed the claim that Bill killed McCall's brother at all, and some believe the outlaw was simply looking for some personal glory. Whatever the reason, one of the most famous men of the Old West was dead, and McCall finally faced justice. For his contributions to the game of poker, Wild Bill was inducted as a charter member of the Poker Hall of Fame in 1979. He was inducted alongside names like Edmund Hoyle, Johnny Moss, and Nick the Greek Dandelos. In Deadwood, the Old West culture and Wild Bill Hickok are still celebrated, and tourists flock to the historic town each summer. Louis Lalonde is the owner of Saloon No. 10 in Deadwood. The watering hole is also a museum with plenty of history about Wild Bill. The original Nuttall and Man Saloon was destroyed by fire in 1879. But Saloon No. 10 serves as a recreation of what a Deadwood Saloon looked like in the late 19th century. The saloon has been in Lalonde's family for decades, and she takes pride in its link to characters like Wild Bill, who has meant so much to the city. Visitors can even check out reenactments of the shooting each summer. There are truly parts of the bar that will take you back to the Old West, and without a doubt, it is a museum. So, you know, we encourage people when they do come in to, um, to enjoy themselves, make themselves at home. They can look at all the memorabilia on the walls, lots of pictures. And um, we do, in the summer months, from mid-May to the end of October, we uh, do a reenactment of the shooting of Wild Bill. Um, it's a, a half-hour some little skit where um, the, our gentleman who um, portrays Wild Bill is um, kind of tells a little bit of the history and and uh, and then you you really get an idea of what it was like that day. It does it does you know take you back there to what um, what actually happened. Poker players from around the world converge on Las Vegas in May, June, and July for the World Series of Poker. No doubt the topic of dead man's hand will come up again and again. 
Many of these card players will rake plenty of chips, occasionally with two aces and two eights. Hello, everybody. This is Sarah Herring, and we hope you're enjoying the show. Just a friendly reminder that this isn't the only show on the Poker News Podcast Network. In fact, we've got a whole bunch of them. For starters, of course, there's me and Jeff Platt coming to you each week on the Poker News Podcast, but we've also got... Hey, everyone. It's Bruce Briggs. And Robbie Straczynski, and we're proud to host the Top Pair Home Game Poker Podcast. Come give us a listen every other week and get your home game poker juices flowing. Hey all, it's Chad Holloway from the LFG Podcast. Along with my co-host, Jamie Kerstetter, we put out a couple shows each month showcasing the mid-stakes grinders who are working their butts off to climb the poker ladder towards fame and fortune. Give us a listen. Hey guys, this is Sean Chafin, writer and host of the True Gambling Stories podcast. Each month we bring you a unique gambling or poker story that will keep you wondering what's next. Be sure to tune in. Hey there, it's Evan Jarvis, host of All In, the poker podcast where we go all the way with poker champions past, present, and future. Get to know the whole story behind their success. Find out what the secret ingredients are that really lead to greatness so that one day you too can call yourself a poker champion. And there you have it, an entire family of great poker podcasts for your listening pleasure, only on the Poker News Podcast Network. Be sure to like, share, subscribe so that you don't miss a single episode. Happy listening and catch y'all later. Hey, you guys, we really hope you enjoyed this month's show. I love Tales of the Old West, and we had a lot of fun producing this one. Please let others know about the show. We appreciate all the shares on social media. And if you like what we're doing, please give us a five-star review, maybe a nice comment on Stitcher or iTunes or TuneIn, wherever you access the podcast. As always, it's easy to just follow the link, truegamelingstories.com, to access or share the show. A big thanks to our guest, Jim McManus. His book, Cowboys Full, is the definitive book on poker history. It's fantastic and a big help. His book, The Education of a Poker Player, is also great. And who can forget Positively Fist Street? If you haven't read it and you're a poker fan, you need to go get it. He's also writing a sequel to Positively Fist Street, hopefully to be published in the next year or so. I can't wait for that. A chapter from that book is also part of the new poker anthology entitled He Played for His Wife and Other Stories. Go check it out. Follow him on Twitter at Jimbo Sweetness. Also, a huge thanks to our guest, Aaron Woodard. He really had some great insight on Wild Bill. His new book is The Revenger, The Life and Times of Wild Bill Hickok. It's going to be released in late June. Please go check it out. And you can also follow him on Facebook, A-A-R-O-N, Woodard, W-O-O-D-A-R-D. Also, a big thank you to Louie Lalonde, the owner of Saloon No. 10 in Deadwood, for her appearance. After hearing so much about Deadwood and doing this podcast, I can't wait to visit that city. For more information, check out Saloon10.com. If you're looking for more stories about poker and gambling, I am in Las Vegas covering the World Series of Poker. So to check out my work and follow all the action, visit PokerNews.com every day. You'll like it. There's a ton of great gambling and poker stuff coming all summer. True Gambling Stories is written and hosted by me, Sean Chafin, and Robert Moreno does a superb job editing the show. Please visit us on Facebook via at True Gambling Stories or on Twitter, we are at Gambling Pod. You can follow me on Twitter at Poker Traditions. And if you like these kinds of stories, please buy my book, Raising the Stakes, on Amazon.com. You can read more of my work at SeanChafin.com. And we always need story ideas. If you have one, please let us know. And lastly, for all your poker and gambling news, information, videos, podcasts, and my future writing and reporting, please visit pokernews.com why you since buffalo wild wings is always open late here are a few things you'll enjoy buzzer beaters wings in 21 signature sauces and seasonings and great deals on food and beer grab select domestic draft beers starting at 450 four dollar shareables like street tacos fried pickles chili queso dip mozzarella sticks and roasted garlic mushrooms and deals on select liquor and house cocktails phew that's a mouthful catch all of the late night action buffalo wild wings wings beer sports offers and participation vary please drink responsibly void where prohibited.